arrives at the offices of the Evening Telegraph. I think upstairs was more of the print works. Now he's down in the offices where people write. The way Bloom enters is almost ghost-like, very quiet. He, uh, there's this conversation going on here as well between Simon Dedalus, Ned Lambert, and Professor McHugh. They are reading a speech that was printed in the newspaper from the night before the speech took place. It is by this guy named Dan Dawson, and the prose is horrible and the gaudiest of poetic phrases. It's, you'll get to witness it, I'm not going to quote it, but it's, it's wonderful in its badness and its gaudiness, I think is something that uh, we'll see even more in Nausicaa. It's just an entire chapter of that, which is whether you're, uh, I don't think you can possibly take it seriously, but if it's done in this extreme, ridiculous way, Joyce makes it very funny. Bloom doesn't even seem present. He's almost like Joyce, the narrator, looking down. But then uh, some guy enters behind him and the door bumps into him. And that reminds us that he is there. He has this physical presence. The man entering is J.J. O. Malloy, a down-and-out lawyer. Uh, some of the men, if you're confused, refer to him as Jack. Uh, I guess one of the J's stands for Jack. They get tired of reading this speech by Dawson, who they refer to as Doey Daw. If I was making a digital audio workstation, I would call it Doey Daw. One of the doors in the office opens. It's Miles Crawford, the editor of the Evening Telegraph, and he is, I guess it's ambiguous if he's drunk, but he's probably drunk. Get out of here, you bloody pedagogue. I like how Joyce phrases or writes down his opening phrase. Get out of here, you bloody pedagogue. Actually, one of the versions says get out, out, hat. Another version says, get on out of that hat. Either way, it's kind of garbled and just pure energy. The suggestion is put forth that they depart and go to the uh, bar to get the taste of uh, Dan Dawson's horrible speech out of their ears. I like when they ask Miles Crawford to join them. He just starts going off about North Cork militia in Ohio. So. Yeah, you can see why people might think he's drunk. Bloom drifts in to use the telephone. He's phoning Alexander Keyes' his store. I think it's out in Sandy Mount, so it's a good distance out there. He wants to make sure he's actually at the store before he heads out, so he calls. Lenahan from Dubliners, he comes in and he's talking about the horse race. He says, oh, Scepter's gonna win. Scepter, by the way, does not win the horse race. It's throwaway, you might remember that. There's newsboys there as well, and then Bloom on the phone learns that Alexander Keyes is not at home. In fact, he's right around the corner at the auction house where they're doing auctions. Uh, so Bloom's like, oh man, I'll just go down and see him there. Let's take a closer look at the map. The offices of the newspapers are here, and Dylan's auction rooms are here, and the river is here, and Nelson's pillar is right over here. As Bloom is leaving, he bumps into Lenahan, who pretends to be slightly hurt. Uh, Lenahan thinks of himself as really very witty, but his jokes are not that funny. He just has a bit of a corny style to him. As Bloom leaves, the newsboys are watching his way of moving. I, the Bloom movie does, I think, that, that gets the movement really well down. He's kind of like, I think he, the actor did a much better job than the Ulysses movie earlier. The, whoever the actor is in Bloom. He, he looks more high, I imagine, Bloom, especially though in his movement. So the newsboys see the way that Bloom walks and they kind of imitate him behind his back. And then the men who see the boys imitating Bloom, they find that amusing. The men are preparing to go to the bar and they start deriding the Roman Empire. And they say, what was their civilization? Vast, I allow, but vile. As you notice things like palindromes in the text and unusual juxtapositions of words and ways of putting sentences together. Remember that these are uh, techniques used in rhetoric that if you look in the back of the annotations, there's a complete catalog, or maybe not complete, actually even more, but a lot of the techniques are listed there. And uh, by having Miles Crawford drunk, that really allows Joyce to fumble with the text however he wants. Stephen arrives with this journalist, O'Madden Burke, and Simon Dedalus has just left to the bar, and Bloom has just left, so he's not going to really run into either one of them. Lenahan, because he's so witty, has this riddle that he gives, and it goes like this. What opera resembles a railway line? Answer, the Rose of Castile. Castile, like to cast down steel, I guess. 
I've never heard or seen this opera, but apparently the music is by an Irishman named Mick Michael William Boff. Stephen delivers to Crawford this letter from Mr. DC, and they notice that a piece of the letter is missing. Stephen ripped it off in Proteus, and he wrote this little poem on it. It goes like this. On swift sail flaming from storm and south, he comes, pale vampire, mouth to my mouth. Incidentally, I looked at the little review version of this chapter and that, um, that poem originally had, instead of vampire, had phantom. But I think Joyce liked the image of a vampire because he includes it at least five or six times in the text. It's uh, one of those images like throwaway that comes up. Is uh, Stephen being vampirized by this world? They talk about Mr. DC. They talk about Greek versus Latin cultures and how Latin Roman culture is based on violence. Great quote from Professor McHugh. The closet maker and the cloaca maker will never be lords of our spirit. Cloaca, you say cloaca, I say cloaca, is a sewer. I had not heard that term before. This idea about how the powerful and the people subject to that power are uh, forced to relate. Like the Roman Empire is just a metaphor for any corporate or larger system that has greater control than any individual. Philip K. Dick took it even farther in a more literal way with the empire never ended, but I think we all live under some form of empire. And things like sewers, like buildings and uh, vast enterprises which we have today would certainly be impossible with the amount of coordination that uh, the corporate idea uh, allows. But at the same time, this is what allows us to be so powerful that we can destroy the planet. So remember that quote, rule the world today. His machineries are pegging away too. Bloom's wife Molly comes up and clearly they are find her attractive and think that she may, uh, there's hints that she may already have had affairs before uh, that people know her as uh, not very faithful to Bloom. Bloom is down in the auction rooms. He phones up to the offices and he says he wants to talk to Crawford. And Miles Crawford says, go to hell. And I, I can just love, I love imagining Bloom's face when he hears that. He'd be like, Crawford is obsessively detailing something that happened in 1882, these murders in Phoenix Park called the Phoenix Park Murders. I believe they've come up before in the book, but I didn't really talk about them. But essentially, let me explain them as clearly as I can. So this group of uh, Irish nationalists who are fighting for uh, independence, the Fenians, they had a splinter group, which was even more extreme called the Invincibles. And they planned this, rather than uh, peaceably trying to uh, obtain Ireland's freedom, <laughs> they uh, resorted to violent means and they planned to murder key individuals in the British government who uh, to send a message that England was not welcome in Ireland. They were that extreme. So on in 1882, they killed uh, two fairly high uh, British officials. I, I forget who they were exactly, the secretary and the undersecretary. And um, you can read all about it on Wikipedia if you want to know more. But essentially, uh, they take pl took place in Phoenix Park, and the spot is marked today where it happened. But after the murders, uh, Miles Crawford is going to be on this map of Dublin, charting their path and putting X's and A's and B's of where they were at certain points after, as they, after the murder took place. You don't really need to know all the names of all these people unless you really want to know about the Phoenix Park murders. But one name that kind of shows up later is this guy, Skin the Goat, also known as James Fitzharris. It is rumored that he operates this cabman's shelter where the, you know, the cab drivers that ride the horses can come and rest and eat or whatever. Uh, we'll see that much later in the book. There's this part where I think Joyce was pretty drunk when he was writing this, but I, I love it anyways. He goes, would anyone wish that mouth for her kiss? How do you know? Why did you write it then? Or maybe we're inside Stephen's head as he's thinking about these things. Mouth, south. Is the mouth south some way? Or the south a mouth? Must be some. South, 
pout, out, shout, drought, rhymes. Two men dressed the same, looking the same, two by two. There seems to be this motif or theme about things that resemble each other being uh, related somehow. The keys crossing, keys being interchangeable, and uh, things like that. These jumps into Stephen's head are very different from the rest of the environment of what's going on. We see that his, his worldview and what is happening inside of him are very at odds with the general tone of this chapter. He thinks of this part about history being a nightmare from which you will never wake again, recalling that part in, where was that? In, uh...